In autumn 2000, this family home in Karkai, Cornwall, bears witness to one of Britain's most shocking crimes. Police find the bodies of Leslie Ford and her four eldest children buried in the woodshed in the garden and in a field near the family home. They uncover a dark taboo of domestic abuse, but have only one suspect, Leslie's husband, Lee Ford. It was a family home, uh, and what had happened to them had been done by someone that they trusted. It was so hard that, that I was here, and I didn't know where my family was, and I just couldn't do nothing about it. I can't imagine that each of those children, one by one, wouldn't have realised that they were walking into their death. By any standards, this was an enormous and pitiful tragedy. It was a tale of true horror. Leslie Ford grew up in Telford, one of three siblings. At the age of 18, Leslie meets local man Michael Tranter. First met Leslie when I was going to work and I caught the bus in the village and Leslie was on that bus. She was working in an old people's home in uh, Wellington when she met Mick. One day we got off together and I walked her home. She was my first love. She was absolutely brilliant and I was over the moon. He's very nice, very pleasant. Wonderful guy, really, at the time. Uh, I thought they were made for each other, really. Michael and Leslie move in together and get married, and soon she is expecting their first child. I was over the moon. Um, it's something that I'd always wanted, and, and to have children with a lovely woman was absolutely, it was, it made it for me. We used to say that she'd end up with a football team. She absolutely adored kids. Sarah Jane was born on the 10th of the 1st, 1983. Um, a few months later, uh, Leslie was pregnant again, and we had um, Anne-Marie. About a year and a half later, we'd had another baby, a baby boy, Stephen Paul, and um, within a year, Leslie became pregnant again with Craig Jonathan. They seem happy as pie. But having four young children so quickly puts pressure on the marriage. And within a year of Craig's birth, Michael moves out and they get divorced. I always thought that me and Leslie would be together for the rest of our lives. Um, and I couldn't imagine that a year down, down that line that um, and we'd actually split. I was quite shocked when they split up because Michael and Leslie were, the, to me, the perfect couple. Um, you know, they got the kids, they had a house. Um, Loved each other, you know, and everything looked fine. In 1990, a year after her divorce, Leslie meets a labourer from Telford, Lee Ford. He seemed very nice, pleasant. Uh, he was younger than her. Yeah, she seemed to be very excited at the time. But Michael and his family don't share Peter's feelings towards Ford. Leslie and Lee wouldn't have been a couple um, on paper. If you looked at Leslie, she was attractive, slim, Nice person. Lee was gruff shaven, scruffy, leather jacket, jeans, always the same clothes. You couldn't sort of have a everyday conversation. It was always interrupted by him saying something about him or showing me something of his. Forensic psychologist Dr. Kerry Nixon works for Merseyside Police, profiling serious violent offenders in domestic homicide cases. She's been analysing Ford's behaviour for this programme. Ford started his relationship with Leslie. He made it very known very quickly that he didn't like any uh, relationship with her previous partner, Michael. He would limit access um, to the children. He would stop her seeing Michael, and he basically wanted Michael out of their lives. That's very indicative of a violent control individual. They're very jealous of relationships with other men, very jealous of previous partners, and he basically was determined to push Michael out of their lives. It becomes clear that Ford doesn't want Michael around and makes it difficult for him to have access to his children. If he answered the door, it was always, they're not ready, they're not clothed, they've not had the breakfast, come back in an hour. I, I'd say it was him more than Leslie, when I distanced him as such from the kids. Um, shouting, swearing, saying Leslie said this and the children are not doing this and they can do this and can't do that. So I was a bit weary when he started being like that. We know that extreme jealousy is a risk factor in domestic abuse perpetrators. 
and therefore they like to think that their wife has never had a previous partner. And in this case, he had four reminders, four children daily reminding them. And Michael was a good father. Psychologist and family relationships expert Emma Kenny deals with access issues in her clinics. She's been looking into this case. Without consistent access, you can't have a consistent relationship and you can't see what's happening in the home. He doesn't want Michael judging what he's doing. Instead, he needs to alienate him, remove him from the family situation. Ford's aggressive nature is beginning to impact on his relationship with Leslie. She used to find me and to tell me that Lee had been hitting her. Could you come up and get him out of the house? She'd be scared, crying. It was quite a few times when I had to go to Telford to to a rescue, really, in some ways, and go up and we used to kick him out. Then the next minute, she was giving him a key to let him back in, really. Lots of women and men in abusive situations do this because that person is very good at saying that it won't happen again. She may have felt like she didn't want to be alone. Who would want me? I've got all these children. This is a man who loves me even though he hurts me. All those things play through your mind. And even though the only thing you should really think about is, how do I make myself and my children safe? Things are never that linear. But Leslie seems to love Ford. And despite the violence, she marries him and they have two children together. I think uh, she could have done better for herself, really. She needed someone a lot better than that. She deserved it, really, because she was so nice and pleasant. She wouldn't hire a hair on your head. But in 1995, after five years of marriage, Leslie decides enough is enough. Realising Ford is violent and dangerous, Leslie tries to escape. She takes all of the children, and moves to Cornwall to be near her family and away from Ford. It's clear from Leslie's actions that she's scared. To move away without affording a dress, to let nobody know where you're going, to take your children and root them straight away to avoid being in that area, suggests that you are terrified. You want to make a new start. You don't want anybody to know where your whereabouts are. You want to be safe. My head was all over the place, frantic, trying to find out where I could get a link to find them. But although Michael cannot find his children, Ford plots a way to track them down. He actually got in touch with Leslie's mom, uh, posing as a solicitor, saying they wanted to know how and where the children were, and Leslie. When Leslie did actually try to break free from the relationship, he stalked her, all with the aim of getting her back. He would not allow her to leave him and that's part of the control, but also that if I can't have you, nobody else is going to have you. You're not getting away from me. Leslie decides to give Ford another chance, but it's a decision that has grave consequences. Her chance of a new start and a better life for her and her children without her abusive husband has gone. Her fate and the fate of her children is now in his hands. This is a man who wants to be number one. For a stepdad to start a relationship with a stepdaughter, it's wrong, very wrong. The last time I spoke to Sarah Jane on the phone was unfortunately the last time that I spoke to any of my children. In 1995, Leslie Ford decides to take back her abusive husband, Lee Ford. They make a fresh start and set up home in Kankai, a small hamlet in Cornwall, with Leslie's six children, the eldest four being from Leslie's previous marriage to Michael Tranter. Leslie taking back a violent man may have seemed the worst decision to take. From her point of view, this is a man who says he's going to change, says he understands what he did was wrong, has followed her to a completely new place, begging for her to take him back. She starts to think the old cliche, maybe he's changed, and that's enough to give it another go. I think it was a love-hate relationship, really. There must have been something there. This is a pattern that we see all the time in domestic abuse relationships. And often it's because the victim at that point has become so low in their self-esteem 
that it's very easy for the perpetrator to manipulate them and get them back. But Ford is not a changed man. In fact, his abusive behaviour escalates and he starts controlling Leslie all over again. He used to be very possessive. He, used, he chose her, all her clothes, what she had to wear. She wasn't allowed to wear what she wanted. Ford is very indicative of a violent control individual that I found in my research and the work that I've done with domestic abuse perpetrators in that he is very emotionally abusive to Leslie. But Leslie finds strength in her role as a mother and from her strong relationship with her children, something Ford resents, according to psychologist Emma Kenny. What we know from Leslie's relationship with her children is that they were paramount in her life. She focused primarily on them. Ford did not like that. We know he started to withdraw and isolate himself. He spent periods of time drinking in the pub and he started to build up resentment, frustration and anger towards Leslie because he was not being put first. This is a man who wants to be number one. Ford seems to be very detached from the family. He says that he would have to spend time watching television in the garage because the children wanted to watch their programs on TV. So rather than being involved in family life, and happy to be involved in family life, and happy to be allowing the children to watch what they wanted to watch on television, he removed himself from the family and became more isolated and more um, engaged in dysfunctional activities, taking drugs and drinking more, which would have escalated the negative feelings that he was having. While Leslie and Ford's marriage appears at rock bottom, the father of her four eldest children, Michael, is over 200 miles away in Telford and has no idea where his children are, as Leslie cut off all contact with him five years earlier at Ford's request. Michael was a loving father. The idea that another man is preventing you being with the children that you adore, it must be the worst situation for anyone to face. He feels redundant. He feels he has no rights and responsibilities to these children. He ultimately feels like there's nothing he can do, powerless and helpless. And in a way, that's exactly his position. It was so hard that, that I was here and I didn't know where my family was. And I just couldn't do nothing about it. The domestic abuse behind closed doors is beginning to have an impact on the children. The eldest two, Sarah Jane and Anne-Marie, are students at Helston School near the family home. Anne-Marie was in my PE group. She was a very quiet girl, um, quite, quite difficult to get to know, um, and it was made worse by the fact that she had quite a poor attendance record, so she often missed lessons. She didn't let people in. She made it really difficult for people to get to know her. It was almost a protective thing. She almost was, there was something that she was trying to hide. So there was a feeling that, that, that not all was well. And on visits to his sister's house, Peter picks up on the tension between Ford and the children. As soon as Lee had gone out of the room or out of the house, and I, they'd be totally different. They'd be bubbly and laughing, joking, running around, jumping up and down and things, really, like normal kids should do. Uh, so he was very controlling over the kids, I think, as well. And Ford is particularly overprotective of 17-year-old Sarah Jane. When they went out, she went out to discos, he would be there to pick her up, to make sure she didn't have a boyfriend. If it had been my brother, the kid's natural dad, I'd have said he's looking out for his daughter. But for him to do that, having now know what we know, then um, obviously he was trying to ward off anybody else going there, as in uh, a boyfriend material. But Ford's feelings towards Sarah Jane are not of an overprotective stepfather. The truth is far more disturbing. In the May, Leslie phoned me. She was worried about uh, Lee Ford. I understand that Leslie, the mom, had found them in bed together. Peter decides something needs to be done, and in May 2000, he gets in touch with Michael for the first time in more than five years. She was crying her eyes out, and I, and I said, look, leave it with me. I'll sort something out. Michael, uh, the kid's first father, I got in touch with them because I was concerned about the kids. Told him the situation and what Leslie told me, what she thought might have been happening, and asked him if he could do anything about it. 
Michael has been desperate for any contact with his children, but it's not the news he was hoping for. When Michael hears about Ford and Sarah Jane, he tracks his daughter down and calls her at a place of work. She actually came to the phone and I said, this is your real dad, Sarah Jane. Um, can I speak to you? And unfortunately, she said she was busy and she put the phone down. If she'd have gone back home and said to her mom and to Lee, my dad's been in contact, I think he might have been aggressive towards them, knowing that, like, my brother had actually found his kids and could be coming back into their life, and he wouldn't have liked that one bit. Well, often with domestic abuse perpetrators, they are extremely jealous, that can make an offender start to think things that aren't true. It's these ruminations in their head that get um, progressively worse. So the fact that Michael was starting to come back into Leslie's life, he was extremely jealous of this and may have started thinking things were going to happen. Ford is furious Michael knows about Sarah Jane and calls Peter to confront him about getting in touch with Michael. He was just angry. I think he probably was worried that people were going to look into him a bit more and see what was going on, I suppose. But despite Peter's intervention, Ford manages to convince Leslie all is not what it seems, and she gets a message to Michael telling him to back off. So they got in contact with me, saying that Sarah Jane was a little bit down after the phone call, but everything was fine. Uh, there was no problems in the, in the marriage. But Leslie's brother, Peter, is angry with his sister, as he doesn't believe Ford's explanation. I spoke to her that evening and I said, look, Leslie, you need to start thinking about the kids, the safety of the kids. The kids are going to get hurt next, and it's not fair. Uh, I never spoke to her after that. I wish I went in there and dragged her out and got her away from there. But it's hindsight, isn't it? It appears that Ford is having a sexual relationship with Sarah Jane, the stepdaughter he's been raising for more than 10 years. People have been saying that he was having an affair with my daughter, and I don't believe this happened. I was actually told that she was being abused. Sarah Jane wouldn't have done anything like that to her mum. It wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship, both together, you know, agreeing. I think it was one-sided. I still do. Sarah Jane was 17 at the time. And she'd been raised by Ford since she was six and seven. So therefore, she saw him as a stepfather. And that was an abuse of his relationship with her, an abuse of his power. He would have groomed Sarah Jane to embark in that relationship with him. So again, we know from the research that there's a clear correlation between child abuse and domestic abuse in homes. And here we have Ford as both a domestic abuse perpetrator and as an abuser against Sarah Jane. For a stepdad to start a relationship with a stepdaughter, it's wrong, very wrong. Um, you should be there to protect the kids, not have sexual relationships with them. It makes me sick, you know. It shouldn't happen at all. For Michael, the realisation that he didn't have a chance to put a stop to this abuse of his daughter is too much to bear. The last time I spoke to Sarah Jane on the phone was unfortunately the last time that I spoke to any of my children. In the summer of 2000, Peter cuts ties with Leslie after issuing an ultimatum. Lee kept phoning, wanting me to talk to Leslie and to phone Leslie, and I said, no, not why she's with you. I said, that's it, Lee. It's about time she started thinking of the kids, not you. A few weeks later, in August 2000, Leslie decides to do something about what she saw. She makes the decision to leave Ford. At this point, she's going to take action. There's one thing hurting her, but there's a very different thing hurting her children. So she seeks legal advice. She goes to her solicitors. She asks for an order to be taken out to restrain him from contact. And she starts the process of getting her life back together. Dr Kerry Nixon believes Leslie's actions are a catalyst for a horrific series of events. With this case, we can see trigger points 
trigger points that seem to tip it over the edge. And with Ford, he's got all those background risk factors in terms of violent control. He's got the emotional abuse, he's got the physical violence, the threats, etc. But Leslie is determined to expose Ford's abuse and leave him, taking the children with her. One night at the end of August 2000, she finds the courage to confront him. An argument ensues, and we've got all the background risk factors combined with these trigger points, combined with the argument, and it all comes down on Ford. He knows it's going to come out about um, Sarah Jane. He knows that the community and people who know him are going to know the details of what he's been doing to Sarah Jane, and that culminates in what happens on that night. Leslie and her four children are never heard of again. Lee Ford is about to commit the most shocking crimes imaginable. I mean, our focus was always on Lee Ford. There was never a look at anybody else. Um, it was just a question of, you know, where's the family? I can't imagine that each of those children, one by one, wouldn't have realised that they were walking into their death. By any standards, this was an enormous and pitiful tragedy. It was a tale of true horror. In late August 2000, Leslie Ford and her four eldest children go missing without a trace. A few weeks after they are last seen, Leslie's husband, Lee Ford, contacts Leslie's brother, Peter. Lee Ford phoned me back and said, put your sister on, I know she's with you. And I said, she's not with me, Lee. Where is she? What's happened? And he told me that they ha had a row over money and things like that. Then the next minute, this car had turned up and she got in it with the four kids and went. But Ford's explanation doesn't ring true. And I said to him, I can't understand her leave, leaving without the two younger kids. And he said, I wouldn't let her take them. There's no way that she's having my kids. I knew something had gone on. Uh, although I didn't want to believe it. I did know something had happened. Peter fears the worst and contacts the police who launch a missing persons investigation. Chris Borland of Devon and Cornwall Police was the senior investigating officer in the case. Once uh, Leslie's brother had reported to the police and he was spoken to, you know, there was, a, there, was, there was an uncomfortable feeling leading to alarm bells ringing quite early. Michael's brother, Andrew, is convinced he knows what has happened to the family. I turned to my wife and for some reason I'd said to her that that Lee had killed the kids. My wife had said to me, you must be mad. And I said, no, I said, I've just got a feeling and I just know that he'd killed the kids. Ford is desperate not to arouse any suspicion. He visits the children's school. The stepfather came into school to return all the school books, um, and a, a very close friend of mine, and he brought the school books back to her, telling her that, um, that the mother had um, returned back to her um, home area in Telford with the children, had left him and, and gone back to her family. He'd cancelled a, 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 a job centre appointment claiming the family had got food poisoning. He actually went to where Sarah Jane used to work at McDonald's and tried to cash her last paycheck. Dr Kerry Nixon believes Ford's behaviour shows a lack of concern over the disappearance of his wife and stepchildren. He gets in touch with an old girlfriend and tries to rekindle his relationship. He carries on living in the house with his children and appears to carry on as if nothing could happen. Again, that shows us how much he was in control of the situation. He was able to detach himself with what had happened and carry on with his life as normal. Whilst Ford plays the role of wronged husband, the police don't accept his version of events. I mean, our focus was always on Lee Ford. There was never a look at anybody else. Um, it was just a question of, you know, where's the family? The police went to Lee Ford's house on the Saturday, and I spoke to the police after that, and he had his suspicions because Lee had put all these cameras around the house. He was probably also very paranoid, and we can see that by the fact that he installed CCTV cameras. He was very paranoid of who was coming close to the house. He wanted to know who was actually visiting the property 
So he obviously knew the net was closing in. The concerns started to raise quite quickly, and as time went on, you know, I had a really uncomfortable feeling about it. Realising police are closing in, Ford takes his youngest two children to family members in Telford. Police issue a warrant for his arrest, and he's apprehended on his way back to Cornwall on October the 5th. I had a phone call from Nikki, my ex-wife, uh, that Lee had been arrested and the forensic team were going into the house. I knew what had happened then, really. I knew that she was dead and the kids. Ford is taken to Camborne Police Station to face questioning. It was about 10 o'clock at night when one of the officers uh, told me he'd been arrested and quite soon afterwards they put their head around the door and said that uh, he'd admitted killing his family and, and had told us where the bodies were buried. And I can remember when we were told the shock in the room that he'd actually admitted killing all his family. Peter's worst fears are about to become reality. They turned up and told us that he'd indicated that he'd killed him. Ford then told police where he'd buried the bodies. Nicky came out and told me that they found the first body. They then told me that they had found the three bodies and where they were in the shed at the back of their bungalow. That they had found Leslie's body, Stephen Paul and Craig Jonathan's body in the shed. Fearing they'd be discovered in the garden, Ford dug up and moved the bodies of the two girls, Sarah Jane and Anne-Marie. He had, in fact, buried the bodies of his family under the woodshed in the garden at his home in Kankai. Uh, he'd started a process then of, of uh, digging those bodies up uh, and had started to rebury them in a, in a local farmer's field. Um, I think he'd moved two of them before he then drove up country to take his other two children, the one that he was actually father to, to, to family members, uh, and was on his way back down, probably to remove the rest of the bodies when he was stopped by the police uh, and he came into our, into our custody. The fact that he was able to go back to the bodies and move them, again, shows further detachment from what he had done. In my mind, he was gonna come back from Telford, go to Cornwall, dig up Leslie, the two boys take him over to the field, bury him with the two girls. If that had happened, I don't think we've ever found him. Michael's four children have been brutally taken away from him. That's a thing that I live with now at the moment as well, that I had no, no contact, didn't know where they were, and I weren't there to help them when they needed me. Because obviously I would have I would have been there and I could have kept him safe. To know that somebody has stolen the lives of the children that you created, terrifying, overwhelmed, confused, guilty, lost, afraid and helpless, just a cataclysm of horror. And for Peter, the loss is immense. There's a big part of you being taken away, really. <laughs> big chunk of you, chunk of you, really, gone. <laughs> a few days after the bodies are discovered, Michael and his brother visit the home in Kankai. One part of me was thinking, they were so lucky to, to be where they were and have such a beautiful surrounding. Um, but then obviously, uh, the other side of me wishes they'd never gone down there and had never met the evil monster. I went round the back. I wanted to see where he buried Leslie and the children. We had to look around the house from the outside, um, seeing all the kids' toys on the lawn, um, the tractor, football, etc. It was a family scene, and to see toys outside, to go into the children's bedroom, 
uh, and see one of the boys' bedrooms with a Manchester United shirt on the wall, as I recall. I think that, that will always stay with me. And the bedroom was as if they'd just left it. Uh, it was a family home, uh, and what had happened to them had been done by someone that they trusted and should have been able to feel safe with. But how did Lee Ford kill five people in this family home and keep the bodies hidden for a month? QC Nigel Pascoe is the prosecuting barrister in the case. Each victim died without any conceivable justification. By any standards, this was an enormous and pitiful tragedy. It was a tale of true horror. Lee Ford confessed to killing Leslie and the children in a 24-hour period in August 2000. We found that out over the 24 hours while he killed the kids that, and Leslie, that he beat Leslie with a baseball bat. They had a row. We think it's over Sarah and Jane and him and he beat her around with a baseball bat. And she was in the bedroom, as far as we know. Then he went out into his garage. There was a piece of rope, and he took the piece of rope back in with him and strangled Leslie with it. But Ford isn't finished there. The four stepchildren he has brought up for more than 10 years are to be his next victims. And then he chose to kill the children one by one, coming up behind them with a length of rope. And as I say, did so in such a way that he left few marks uh, on their necks. So it was, as the pathologist said, an efficient form of killing. He grotted them. Uh, the police did say that he'd researched, researched it on, a, on the internet quite a bit and how to kill them. He systematically, one by one, killed them. Coldly killed them. He seemed to be in control. He'd gone outside after assaulting Leslie, and he went back in. And he did it one by one. And that's what's really important here. That suggests a great element of detachment and a lack of feeling. There wasn't a frenzied, uh, emotional, outburst of anger. He was very in control. He may well have snapped when he killed uh, Leslie, but then to uh, cold-bloodedly and systematically uh, kill the children individually in the kitchen, you know where you're going to be able to claim that that's a crime of passion then. That was quite calculated and chilling. So many things play around your mind. Did they know? Were they aware that he was doing that to each of them? I can't imagine that each of those children, one by one, wouldn't have realised that they were walking into their death. The thought of it even now is still in my head, and it always will be. For those left behind, Ford's actions are impossible to understand. He brought the kids up for practically nearly 11 years, and I, I don't know how anyone could do what he did to him, really. I don't think he had any feelings now, really, towards any of them in some ways. He couldn't have not to do what he'd done. He couldn't have thought much of what he had, because how could you do that? An only an evil monster could do that. But why did Ford spare his two youngest children? Potentially that he had completely different feelings and bonds to his own children, which again, we can see in his previous behaviour towards Sarah Jane. You know, he systematically abused and groomed Sarah Jane into a sexual relationship. He showed very little love and attention to Leslie's children. They were Michael's children. There was a completely different bond between his children and, and Michael's children. As the country looked on in horror, Ford faced justice. 33-year-old Lee Ford arrived at Truro Magistrates under police escort. It's alleged that between the 26th of August and the 5th of October, he murdered his wife, 36-year-old Leslie Ford. He's also accused of killing her four teenage children between the same dates. But incredibly, he pleads not guilty, and a trial date is set. This is not a crime of passion, but of calculated savagery. 
I have never known anything like it before. In October 2000, Lee Ford is awaiting trial for the murder of his wife Leslie and his four stepchildren in the small hamlet of Kankai, Cornwall. The horrific murders have a massive impact on the friends of the children. They were distraught students, and I think it's also because they're just too close to home. I think it suddenly made them realise that actually, you know, it could happen to any of us. And the fact that it happened inside their family home with their own family, it shattered their foundations. It really wobbled their foundations. And, and the things that they had been brought up to believe in, the strength of the family and the commitment of the family, um, all kind of counted for nothing, really. The school set up a book of condolence and a memorial garden for the children. And many attend Leslie Ford's memorial service held at Truro Cathedral. I carried the coffin. And that, that was the last thing I could do for her, really. Uh, she would have been proud to be, to go to the cathedral, really. Uh, the kids got up and spoke from the school. It was very moving. They were always laughing and loved life. They cracked jokes. Stephen loved Eminem's music. I should miss them all greatly. It's a very emotional day, really. The four children are buried in Telford, near Michael and his family. The day of the funeral was horrible. Um, seeing the cars turn up with the four coffins. The first car had the bodies of Sarah Jane, Dan Marie in it, and then the second car had Stephen Paul and Craig Jonathan. And I couldn't contemplate, really, that I was still here and my children weren't. Went into the church, come out, buried my two nieces, two nephews. It's a shame we couldn't bury the mum with them because she'd never left her side. Meanwhile, Lee Ford is still pleading not guilty. We often see the same with, with violent offenders and people who have, have killed um, their partners. Um, and it's often that they think they can get away with it. You know, he thought he could outsmart the police. In May 2001, at Bristol Crown Court, Lee Ford appears charged with five counts of murder. The prosecuting barrister is Nigel Pascoe, QC. In court, we try to keep the emotion out of it. But in this case, inevitably, what pervaded the atmosphere was a sense of horror. This is not a crime of passion, but of calculated savagery. I have never known anything like it before. But at the last minute, Ford changes his plea to guilty. It's only when it came to the point of the trial, and that's probably because he then didn't want uh, to everybody to know exactly what had gone on. People do not usually plead guilty to murder. What it indicates is the defendant must have appreciated that there was no conceivable psychiatric defense, and accordingly, he entered his plea. But Ford never provides police with an explanation for why he committed these heinous crimes. What we never ever got to was, was a motive uh, as to why he'd done it. Um, fair amount of speculation as the investigation went on. Um, supposedly there'd been a sexual relationship with uh, the oldest girl in the family, the 17-year-old girl. Um, you know, was it that um, with the potential of his, his wife and children leaving him that that would come to light? I think we've all speculated that that may have been the reason, but, um, you know, we never did get an explanation for it. Ford tells police that he flipped after Leslie threatened to stop him having access to his children. But forensic psychologist Dr. Kerry Nixon believes that was one of a number of key trigger points that tipped Ford over the edge. He thought his life was falling around. He thought Leslie was leaving him, Michael was back in the life, and most importantly, at that point of that particular day, he was going to be named and shamed in his eyes as somebody 
who'd taken advantage of his stepdaughter. And that was probably one step too far. Peter Wyatt attends court, coming face to face with Ford for the first time since the murders. I can picture Lee standing there in court, even now. And that's nearly 13 years ago, really, in court. And uh, he just looked straight ahead, didn't bat her eyelid, wasn't concerned, didn't seem to worry at all. There was no remorse at all, ever. I hate him. I hate him. On the 24th of May, 2001, the judge sentences Ford. Lee Ford was convicted of the murder of his wife, Leslie, who was aged 36, and her children, Sarah Jane, 17, Anne-Marie, 16, Stephen, 14, and Craig, 13. In consequence, he received five life sentences and a tariff of 27 years. Five life sentences is, is absolutely right. Um, you know, and I, and I hope he's inside for a very, very long time. But for some, Ford's sentence is not enough. I have to keep him. I have to keep a roof over his head. My taxes. I still pay for him to be alive. I pay for his food, his drink. Why should I after what he's done to us? He should never, never, ever be released. He should be hung. Should be hung. For Nigel Pascoe QC, the harrowing events of this case still haunt him today. My heart goes out to the relatives who are left. It's impossible to understand how this must have affected them. But there isn't a single one of us involved in this case who does not regret the continuing anguish which they must suffer. This, this bastard has really took my family away from me. I'm not the same person. I still seem to pay my brothers in when it comes to birthdays, Christmas, etc. things like that. It's still hard for him, it's still hard for everybody. Kills you, really. Kills the whole family, really, doesn't it? In some ways. Because Leslie was the main part of the family, really. And the kids. Those left behind will never forget the horror of what happened but they get the strength to carry on from the relationships they have with their family. Me and Michael are close. It's brought us closer together. It does get easier, but never forgotten. For Leslie's brother, Peter, the only way to deal with his loss is to remember the good times he shared with his sister. How do I remember Leslie? <laughs> when we were younger. And when she was with Mick, really. I try not to think of the rest of the time. Just think of the good times, really. Michael finds some comfort in the book of condolence given to him by his children's school. There's another one here to Craig and family. We'll always miss you, Lois. We'll never forget you. And you always bring, bring a smile to our faces. Lots of love from Sam and Ben. There's one here, Anne-Marie. You were such a kind person, always happy and smiling, and we will all miss you, from my friend Dan. More than 10 years have passed since the murders, and the pain is still raw, but Michael believes the spirit of his four beautiful children and their mum lives on. I've got their memories, and it does get me through the day, um, seeing them, and... Uh, no one that's still there with me. <laughs>